I'm, pr I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this one. It's not quite Amanda quality, but it's for, for Tim quality. It's a good one, I have to admit. Okay. Uh, good Friday morning to the to to you all, the backyard naturalist community. It, it's it's great to be back here in season five. I was sad to be away for a couple of weeks the, for the season premiere, and I was uh, last week's talk. I was sad to be away for that, but I'm very happy to be back here with you all today. Um, thanks for spending time with me in this in, in this wonderful community of curious naturalists. Um, I, I think. My my rolled down kind of the darker side of the backyard started a, a couple months ago. I'm starting to become more fascinated with the things that feed on us and prey on us and and really become a nuisance to us. Um, so the 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 parasites of human beings um, in this kind of weird and and fascinating and scary and icky side of our backyard ecology. Um, so we we had leeches, we had ticks. Before that, we had mosquitoes, vampire bats, um, and we still have a whole host, uh, pun intended, of hematophagic animals, meaning they they primarily eat blood, um, or or a big chunk of their diet is blood, um, and we still have a lot of them out there to do uh, fleas and and bed bugs and and lampreys and um, I don't know. It's cool to me that there's a whole set of animals out there that have done that, that have specialized on, on eating blood, um, just blood. It doesn't surprise me, but it does fascinate me. So we'll look at a, a new set of blood sucking creatures, the noceums here in episode three of season five of the Backyard Naturalist, C No M. This summer evil gets small. And like PBS, we'd like to thank our viewers, whether you're watching live or recording, I'm delighted to be sharing time with you. And like PBS, um, well, maybe unlike PBS, we don't do pledge drives, uh, but we would absolutely love it if you purchased an annual or seasonal subscription to keep this sacred Friday morning time slot going and going. Um, we have a lot of fantastic guest hosts lined up this fall and beyond, uh, as well as our, our homegrown talent at UEC. We have some great monthly field trips lined up. Um, they're open to the public, but they're free for subscribers. And uh, as I mentioned, we're finalizing the details on a party at a local green space. Um, buying a subscription is one of the best ways to support the research and community science team at the center. So if you enjoy doing other things with us, um, this is a great way to, to support our team, um, even if you can't make all of the talks, although we love it when you can. Um, and if you know someone who might enjoy this, uh, this, this community, uh, tell them about us or, or you know, if you can get get them a gift subscription, um, but we know we know that not everyone can or or chooses to get a subscription, and 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 we love everybody that is here uh, with us right now. Okay. Um, oh, and I I do want to also put a, a quick plug in uh, to the 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 Urban Ecology Center's Eco Travel Program. I got a little bit of a teaser for the upcoming trips. Um, and oftentimes the veterans of our past trips want to know where we're going next, especially where we're going next if it's somewhere we haven't been yet. And I'm really excited for um, going to a new location, Southern California. Uh, our, our very own Amanda Tokiyama is a native of Southern California. Um, and so she's put together a fantastic traveling experience for us in late February, early March. Uh, we're going to spend the week exploring Los Angeles and Malibu, Thousand Oaks, the Channel Islands. Um, all of the great plant communities, the the wildlife, the marine life. Uh, this picture on the lower left is the world's largest wildlife crossing. Um, it, and looks like a absolutely fantastic trip that Amanda's put together. Uh, and we're also returning to the Galapagos and our marketing team has put together just a little video snippet. So we'll watch that here together.
And all of those photos were taken by uh, participants on our last trip. And it just kind of shows you how close you, you can get to the wildlife on that trip. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to go many great places in the world. And, and this place is like no other. Um, you're, you're snorkeling and, and it's really like the wildlife are checking you out. The sea lions come up to you. The turtles come up to you, check you out. The penguins. Um, and I've really never seen a place where people in wildlife just really feel like they're cohabitating. The the people aren't bothering the wildlife. The wildlife aren't bothering the people. Um, you know, you're walking through town and there's a sea lion using a park bench to take a nap. Um, and they also have very strict and effective uh, systems in place for conservation uh, because tourism can really overwhelm a place. 95% um, of the islands are national park. Um, you're required to have a local guide with you at all times. There are strict controls in terms of group sizes and other things. Um, and, and we also, you know, get into like the social implications of all this on, on the folks that live there. So uh, if you're interested in this trip, contact me or check out the, the UEC Eco Travel website. And um, whoops, hang on a second. Uh, we're heading back to Costa Rica next August in a trip uh, that is going to be fully wheelchair accessible um, and accessible to folks with uh, mobility issues. We're partnering with a great local organization, El Viaggio Travel in Costa Rica, in addition to case Costa Rica Rainforest Experience, um, and put together this trip. So uh, again, please contact me if you're interested. And now we'll move on to no seams. And, and like Maggie at the beginning, really the place that I wanted to start is what the heck were they? Because I didn't really know a lot either. I just knew that they were annoying as 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 heck. Um, I, I you know I knew they bit me. Um, I, and but you know mosquitoes bite you. And it, when when you look at an image of them, they they just kind of look like mini, mini mosquitoes, um, but they're not mosquitoes. So uh, the question is, what are they? And um, not surprisingly, they are are related to mosquitoes. So if, if we go back to the common grouping that includes both mosquitoes and noceums, that's the order Diptera, which is a huge, huge order. Um, it's the flies, die means two, Ptera means wings, so Diptera means two wings. Uh, and essentially most, most insects have, a lot of insects have two pairs, that's kind of the general form, uh, or, or four wings for flights, uh, four wings and hind wings. Um, but the dipterans only use the four wings for flight. Uh, the hind wings have evolved into this fantastic sensory organ that's really like a, a haltier, or it's called a haltier, but it's like a, um, it's like a, a, a gyroscope in a plane, um, and it, and it really allows them to to just perform these fantastic acrobatics that allow them to stay out of the reach of your swatting them away, or or you know, and they just fly to the ceiling and land uh, and laugh at you. Um, we, we think there's over a million species of flies. We've described about 125,000 of them. Um, but in this, this group includes horse flies, crane flies, fly flies, mosquitoes, midges, uh, gnats. Um, and for a while, the, the noceums kind of follow the same mosquito lineage through the subgroupings like superorder and infraorder. Uh, but then they split off at superfamily. And then the noceums are in this name that just rolls off the tongue, Ceratopogonidae. Um, so, but essentially, this group is called the noceums, or um, maybe you've heard of them as biting midges. Uh, and to get into the the etymology here, um, noceum comes from English, and it it means you can't flip and see these little jerks. Um, one of the most common characteristics of the 5,000 species, roughly worldwide, is that they are really, really small. Um, the average size of a noceum is about two millimeters, or about a twelfth of an inch. Um, and it's kind of hard to, to okay, what does that mean? Um, and you know, since a lot of the photos have to be magnified. Um, because otherwise all the photos would look like this. This is kind of, you know, this is even magnified a little bit. Uh, this is a, a what a two millimeter organism looks like for scale on, on a finger. Um, actually, this is this is actually magnified quite a bit because fingers aren't that big. Uh, it, so if this doesn't do it for you, and if you have one, if you have a credit card nearby or, or after the talk, if you have a credit card, 
um, pull out the card and then uh, email me the information on the card, the the expiration date, um, the the pin number. Um, I, no, wait, you pull out the credit card, hold it flat in front of you, look at the edge of that credit card. That edge is how long a midge is from front to back. Um, they're just so small and 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 so diabolical. And and here's here's another kind of way to if, if just to to visualize how small they are held up to uh other small things like like a dime or the 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 tip of a pencil. They are smaller than fleas. They are really, really small. Um but they begin life innocently enough. They are an insect that undergoes complete metamorphosis with four life stages. Uh, they start out as very, very, very small eggs. Actually, the eggs aren't much smaller than um, the adults because these, these larvae are kind of, uh, or the the ins the what are be going to become larvae when they hatch are kind of folded in there. Um, uh, so you, you can't do anything to scale here, but they're. Well, I just have to know that these are really small eggs. Um, they hatch and then they become very, very small larvae that crawl around and start eating. And if you're that small, um, there's not a whole lot you can eat yet, but they they start out uh, usually by eating algae. They start off kind of as, as vegetarians. Um, so everything's just kind of a, a, a big, big wet salad bar. They, they scrape algae off of rocks and plants. And um, but as they get bigger, they they can move on to bigger things. Um, cause there are other small organisms out there and, and then they start to eat other animals and, and that becomes important later in the story. Uh, then the larva turn into pupa, a stage where they don't eat because they are transforming into the adult form, also known as the imago. I keep wanting to call them Yago, but that's, that's someone different. Um, the imago or the adult, uh, biting midge or noceum. Uh, but even even here, even when they're starting out as adults, they're pretty innocuous. Um, in, in fact, at this point in their lives, they're mostly feeding on nectar and plant material. So sweet little angels just eating sweet little nectar, going around sipping sugar, helping the world by pollinating plants. Uh, they're very important pollinators. So this is a male noceum, and the males tend to have more elaborate feathery antenna for for a courtship and finding females. So yeah, so far everything's pretty good and if it if it ended here that'd be great. But in, in order for the species to carry on, the females need to lay eggs and to do this she needs blood. She most of them need blood and they need the protein in the blood for the eggs. Um so that's when they literally become thorns in our side. Um their, their sucking mouth parts are razor sharp, like tiny hypodermic needles. Um, and for me, it's easy to think of invertebrates like this as just soft and squishy. So it's it's hard for me to imagine something that is this tiny and delicate having an extremely sharp, pointy little knife on its mouth. Um, actually, four four cutting blades in their mouth. You just I just it, it's hard for me to think of that for some reason. Um, four cutting blades that easily penetrate our skin. I mean, you have one job skin, you protect us and you let this tiny squishable little insect right through the front door. Um, they, they tap into our, our pesky habit of breathing and releasing carbon dioxide into the air. And that's how they find us. Um, once, once their proboscis penetrates the skin, like a lot of other blood sucking insects, they have kind of their own little cocktail of, of, of chemicals. Um, just like the leech has its own cocktail, the mosquito, when a wasp stings you, they all have their own little like proprietary uh, chemical grouping. Um, the biting midge saliva essentially causes the blood to pool up under our skin, making it easy for them because they are so tiny uh, and then allows for a very quick blood meal. It is painful, but Oftentimes, I don't know, just because it's so small, you don't know what's going on and and, and it happens so quickly. Um, and, you know, if it were just that, if it were just a, a sharp, painful, quick bite, um, you know, it, it's so tiny, it can't get that much blood from you. Um, it, it'd be it'd be fine at this point, right? Like, OK, that's annoying. Um, 
and the amount of blood they take from you is is like way less than like a drop. <laughs> um, so that's not the issue. The, the the problem is that their proprietary mix of chemicals in their saliva uh, is is likely going to stay with you for a while after they they finish. And people react differently, just like they they react differently to to a lot of of uh, these chemicals that that animals inject into you, um, depending on how allergic you are. Um, for some, it's not terrible. It becomes a little itchy and, and, you know, goes away with a little while in a little while. Um, for some, the, the reaction can be huge and, and last, you know, a week or more. Um, uh, but usually the reaction is it's just an in, insanely itchy. Um, and they leave, lesions you know that range in size from you know uh, the size of a dime to like much much bigger uh depending again on how you react um so i if you want to i i'm sparing you the gross pictures of um some some noceum uh bites from the web if you like to you you're, you're welcome to go and look at them i'm gonna leave you with this one that's a little more tame and this is a tame one like there's it, it gets much worse um so just because of where they are and where you are it's very common to get bites around your ankles and lower legs if you're wearing sandals it's going to get in between where you know the the holes were were in your shoes if they're open um it, it you shouldn't scratch them um, because it, it can often make it worse, uh, but it's almost impossible not to. Um, mercifully, that's usually the extent of the damage um, because they're not really a major vector for diseases to humans. Um, but, you know, again, depending on, on your reaction, it can be much worse, but you usually don't have to worry about catching anything major like you do with uh, ticks and mosquitoes. This is not the case, however, for for hoof stock, for for livestock and, and ungulates. Um, deer in particular and horses in particular uh, can get some really nasty diseases from noceums, from biting midges. Um, there's a, a African horse sickness. There's blue tongue disease, um, mansonelliasis, arboviruses, hemorrhagic diseases. Um, so even though they're not a major public health threat to humans, they're more of an annoyance, they can be a huge problem for us. And, and we've known this for a while. And uh, because of the potential economic damage um, that biting midges can cause us or the, the emotional damage if they attack, uh, you know, an animal close to us, uh, they have been one of the targets of the, the terrible DDT rollout in the 1940s, along with mosquitoes and, and some other insects that, that caused so many problems for humans and wildlife and uh, just the awful habit of just spraying it everywhere, spraying it uh, you know, and, on people. And you can't really read that sign probably, but it says that it's, um, that what they're spraying is completely harmless to humans. Um, and then of course, all of the major problems that DDT had uh, on wildlife and birds in particular, Silent Spring. Um, so, but this, this was one of the, this was one of the, the targets for all the DDT spraying. Thankfully, we're no longer spraying uh, kids in the environment, at least not in this country, um, with DDT. But there's still a there's still a pain in our ankles. So, the the modern day warfare against midges consists of very similar to the precautions we take against their cousins, the mosquitoes, or 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 even ticks or chiggers. Um, so, bug repellents are the most common deterrent. You just kind of Put it on and, and hopefully that'll work against all of the, the big three. Um, the, the, the efficacy of these on um, noceums in particular is questionable, but you know, DEET is most popular. I, I personally don't trust putting DEET on my skin. I, I go for the hippie stuff that's probably a little bit less effective. And if you are into the more hippie stuff, um, eucalyptus shows the most promising, um, uh, it, it is the most promising in terms of, of uh, noceums in particular. Um, but, but probably the best thing you can do is, is, is how you dress, where you go, uh, even, and, and especially for noceums is time of day. The, the noceums here in our parts of the, of the world are most active at dusk. In fact, in, um, in kind in Florida and Alabama, the, the noceums have the name, they could, they call them five O's, 
um, because of their tendency to come out at about five o'clock. Uh, so if you're in an area uh, and you know there's a lot of no you, you can, if you can, um, you can try to avoid the the dusk, you know, time periods. Um, but you can dress, you know, cover up, cover up bare skin. Uh, you, you can also try for, you know, the, the mosquito nets. The problem is some of the mosquito nets that are out there are actually too big for no because they're that small and they can just absolutely get right through them. So you have to make sure that the mesh is fine enough if it's no seams that you're, you're trying to get rid of. And then the same goes for, for screens, screen doors and windows. Again, mostly these are for flies and mosquitoes, but no seams can get through them and they're also attracted to light. So um, I didn't realize that, that, you know, in certain areas that they, they can and will enter your house and become a problem uh, in your house too. So you just, again, addressing the problem, if it's there, making sure it's a fine enough mesh um, but that's it just another example of how how small they actually are. Um, so yeah, there's there's some less less damaging ways that we can kind of um, keep uh, no CMs at bay. if you if you do get bit and you and you know, again, trying not to scratch it, which is almost impossible, uh, wash the area with soap and water. Um, you can soothe the area with ice, kind of like similar how you would do maybe for a wasp bite. Um, some people use rubbing alcohol, um, allergy meds, after bite, uh, but just it's likely that things are going to suck for a while. Um, in addition to the name five O's, the other names that are used uh, colloquially are punkies, particularly if you live in the Northeast, we'll have to ask Jenny about that one. Uh, pinion gnats, if you live in the Southwest. Uh, moose flies if you're up in up there in in Canada, but uh, back to the life cycle of the midge after she bites you and and leaves you in in your misery and she's right re she's ready to lay her eggs. Uh, she'll look for wet, uh, either water or or damp places to lay her eggs. And part of this again depends on the species. So it could be right in the water. It could be in just moist soil. Um, moist sand, uh, and one female could lay up to seven clutches in her life, depending on, on the species. Um, they can lay several clutches in a year. Each clutch can be anywhere from 25 to 400 eggs. So one female can make a lot of baby noceums in her lifetime, a couple thousand or more. And then just to sum up again, here's the, here's the life cycle. The entire process can take anywhere from two to seven weeks. Um, and then if they're overwintering, they usually do that in the aquatic uh, larval stage. So living fast, the males will die after mating. Females can live on to give several broods. And um, yeah, so no seams can be really annoying. Uh, ruin your day, be, be pretty miserable, but uh, I am gonna throw them a bone here and and leave you with a couple of stories that just might soften your image of biting midges. So let's take a look at this picture. So this is two larval insects. One larva is eating the other. The one doing the eating is a hungry midge larva. So remember, they start off eating the algae, they get bigger, they get bigger, and then they can start attacking other small things. Um, so the one doing the eating is a midge larva. The one being eaten is a mosquito larva and not just any mosquito larva. This is a species of mosquito that carries dengue and malaria. So um, uh, it's hard to imagine this, this tiny creature as a predator eating actual other beings, not just sucking blood. Um, but mosquito larvae are a favorite meal of, of quite a few noceum species in the larval form. So that's a celebration. Uh, I think in itself, uh, biting midges help keep mosquito populations in check. And uh, I, another quick fun fact, and I just absolutely love this picture. So most blood meals from midges come from other vertebrates. They they like mostly mammals. Um, they'll get birds and 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 reptiles too. Um, but some will specialize on feeding off of other invertebrates, not just eating them like the mosquito larvae, but actually tapping into and and sucking 
the insect's blood, um, which which is a little harder to imagine because the insect is so small. And so if they bite us, they're just taking a teeny tiny part of us that we don't even know the blood loss. But if they're eating another insect, that's that's got to be a percentage wise, probably a lot more than, you know, 175 pound human. But this particular photo, it's it's going a step farther. It's not eating the in, in the mosquito blood. It's tapping into the mosquito blood meal. Um, so it's uh, the mosquito bit something. And then the the little midge landed on the mosquito and started, oh, you got a pretty nice little blood meal here. I think I'll help myself to that. Um, so I, I don't know. That's 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 pretty cool. And and then if we go back to this picture, throwing throwing them another bone here. Um, so this is the picture of a, a an adult male midge pollinating a flower, which they do quite a bit. So they're important for for plant communities. Um, this particular one might be of more interest to you. Um, after being pollinated by this midge, this particular flower is going to turn into this fruit, uh, which you may recognize or not. When you open this fruit, it has a delicious pulp, and the pulp surrounds a bunch of seeds, and the seeds alone are very bitter, but then when you roast them and grind them, add a little bit of cornstarch, vanilla, sugar, you get bliss, you get chocolate. So chocolate has a very complicated uh, system uh, of reproduction, and the chocolate plant owes its existence in the world to, to biting midges in particular um, for pollination through time. Uh, it's it's actually one of the biggest issues facing the chocolate industry today um, is the fact that the chocolate plant has such a complicated, complex relationship um, with midges. So we will visit this story again because we haven't done chocolate on Backyard Naturalist and, and we'll, we'll revisit our midge friend. Um, but yeah, if you like chocolate, uh, you, maybe maybe if you if you have a ankle full of bites, it'll help ease the annoyance a little bit. So, um, so so thank you, Noceums. Thank you for keeping mosquitoes in check. Thank you for bringing chocolate to the world. Uh, you're a wonderful part of our backyard ecosystem. And um, oh yeah, I, I forgot you do the other thing too, the whole bitey bitey thing. But I still appreciate you and. I'm going to leave you with this picture of Zen and karma and whatever it is. So thank you for joining me today. I'm going to turn, stop sharing my screen.